Welcome in to K-State Online. This is the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young, Drew Galloway. Man, very rarely is it the three of us all together, but uh, we're bringing the triumvirate today on a Thursday to talk a little bit about what happened between K-State and Baylor on Tuesday night, but really how it kind of factors into the Big 12 at large because this league after the midweek kind of continues on its stretch of I don't know that we should say unpredictability because I think some of the results that we got this week were predictable. I think there were a lot of people that agreed that K-State had a good chance to beat Baylor. Uh, and I think some of the other outcomes like, you know, Iowa State and BYU playing each other, they're, they're kind of like the same team. I, I don't really fully buy into them being as good as what like the metrics say that they are, but they're fine. And Iowa State went on the road and lost to BYU. Uh, we saw KU take care of business against a really bad Oklahoma State team. But we did get one kind of surprising result, and it's starting to not really impact anything at the top because uh, Texas is currently kind of in a league of their own in the bottom uh, portion of the Big 12. So a lot to talk about with the Big 12, but I guess we'll just start. Let's go back to Tuesday. K-State gets the win against Baylor, sets them up with the opportunity that with Houston's win then on Wednesday night, K-State is back into this tie for first place in the Big 12. It's only four games. There are 14 of them left. But through these four games and how they've played and who they've beaten now, where where do your guys' opinion change on where K-State finishes in the Big 12? Because I think going into the non-con, I mean, you guys can say how you feel. I, I thought this was a team that you're probably looking at like seventh or eighth. And that based on how they had played in some games, you, you probably thought that was being generous. Uh, but now. I don't think that this team is going to win the Big 12, but they certainly look like a team that are going to be in the upper portion of the league, and that's not something that seemed possible a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I would say I probably thought they were in that 8 to 10 range, you know, maybe a couple weeks ago. And now, especially because I just sent you my Big 12 power rankings, you know, four through seven, Seems pretty similar, and I have Kansas State in that neighborhood. So, to be honest, I'm left a little unchanged, probably because I was a little bit more optimistic than others and kind of saw this coming a few weeks ago um, compared to what I was then to now. So it's a little bit – because I'll, I'll be honest with you, last week I think what Kansas State in our collective rankings ended up with ninth or 10th, I believe, in our Big 12 power rankings, but I added them the highest, I believe, at seven. And though they they get that win over Baylor, I did my rankings. I just sent it to you, and I still have them seven. Mm -hmm. So I I'm a little left unchanged. Yeah, I, I thought K State was probably in that like eight to ten range, where now four to seven is probably possible. But kind of like Dy said, like the way that this the schedule kind of lined up, I don't really have much of an opinion because. Yeah. You probably played one of the worst teams in the league at West Virginia, and you've took care of business at home, and then you lost to Texas Tech. So it's more like in a few weeks, I think you'll really see where K-State is when they go to Ames next week and to Houston next week, where that that's kind of where you'll see, is this team really in that 4-7 to seven range? Are they higher? Are they lower? But right now they're just kind of taking care of business, I think. You better make sure you beat Oklahoma State because yes, like, yes, because and 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 I put you in a great position. You're sitting there four and one in the Big Twelve, um, for two at a schedule or not. That's a good place to be, and you probably need that security because you could very well lose in both Ames and Houston, and no one's going to judge you for it. But you could very well do that. Well, we we talked about this. Uh, on Sunday, and I just kind of said, like, K-State right now, they have the ability to play up with whoever else, but they also have the ability to play like Oklahoma State at times. And so your hope would just be that that does not happen on Saturday when you actually play Oklahoma State because they look pretty bad based on how that they played uh, on Tuesday against KU, which, look, it's not like KU is an easy opponent to face, but they were at home, and KU has traditionally under Bill Self had a tricky time in Stillwater, and that just was not the case this year. It was a blowout from the jump. So that is that you got to take care of business against the bad teams. And and K State, 
while they've been doing that most of the time, they've shown that they can play at a level that would put them in a bad spot. And look, the pokes are not good. I'm not going to sit here and try to come up with a scenario and lie to anyone that they're be be careful doing this because I did this in football season before K State played Oklahoma State, and we know what happened. That I'm not going to say that they're eons and eons better than what they have showed. I don't think that they are. But on top of being probably the worst team in the league so far this season, they've also been the unluckiest because one, the schedule hasn't been ideal, and two, like they're the only team in this league, I believe to have travel issues at each of the road games. Like they're they're showing up like an hour before and that's just not I won't say it's not fair because it's just the way the cookie crumbles and you really can't change timings of games that much because you got another one two or three days later, but that's just it's hard to do, right? Like they literally were trying to land in Iowa in a blizzard and didn't get there to basically right at tip time to the point that the Big 12 had to move back to tip time 3 hours. So not that they would have won that game. They would not have, in my opinion. But that's just making a bad team look even worse. Yeah, it's – there, and, I mean, you look at it, and the teams that they've also played at home, I mean, they're, I think they're the only team that's played Baylor and KU at home. So, like, they're they're the, also getting unlucky Fair. in that situation. But, like, they're also just not a good basketball team. The, their best win is uh, Tulsa. Probably. Yeah. And they've lost a few bye games as well. They're not good. Yeah. No, uh, but in case it, it's another game that on the schedule, kind of like UCF or so we thought uh, in West Virginia, it's just, it's more about K state and not really anything Oklahoma state does unless they just have some ungodly shooting night that we're not accustomed to. So <laughs> and, we'll and see. Unfortunately, it's like, teams in other conferences where you don't get this often in the big 12, but you're going to get it a couple times this year where you have to win, but it doesn't really help you. You have to win to avoid it hurting you because this is, it's almost a lose, lose situation. Now lose, lose is kind of in the eye of the holder. You win, you're not losing. I get that. But a win does, does not help you, but a loss is catastrophic. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And honestly, like uh, the Big 12 is all about how you handle those situations where take care of your business at home or against the bad teams when you get it and then maybe go and steal a game or two on the road like, you know, K-State almost did against Texas Tech. Uh, and, And that's why I think, you know, we'll talk about next week down the road, but Next week is going to be huge for K-State. You have two road games again in the week at Iowa State, at Houston. Look, Houston is still a really good basketball team, and they're going to be a much different animal at home than on the road right now as they continue to try and adjust to what it's like to play in the Big 12 and and road atmospheres. But I have seen really good Houston teams lose to much worse teams than K-State at home. Like, the opportunity will be there for K-State to go on the road twice next week and get at least one win. And if you're able to steal that, you put yourself in a really golden spot because at that point, think of how we've talked about K-State and what they need to do to get in the NCAA tournament. If you can just win you know, a second road game already in the Big 12 next week, and then what's left on your schedule is uh, what, like eight, you got seven more or I guess at that point it'd be six more Big 12 home games, and you just take care of your business there, you're, you're going to be fine. You're going to be able to get in. So uh, I think if, if you show the ability to go on the road and steal a win, like you know some teams have done already, and K-State was you know an extra step away from doing in Lubbock last weekend, I think that's going to be a, a, a pretty significant deal. What helps is – I don't know that they're all quad one technically according to the net right now, but I think they will all eventually be. But what helps is I think you're going to have five quad one games at home mm-hmm. against Oklahoma, Kansas, BYU, Iowa State, and probably TCU, although I don't think they're quite there yet, but probably TCU at the end. Like Kansas State's 26 and two at home under Durham Tang. You you gotta think even getting that to Three, three. Now I think it don't get more than three wins out of that bunch. But even three, you go three and two. 
which would probably feel disappointing. But you go three and two, you add in the one you already have, quad one and Baylor, that gives you a four. And if Villanova and LSU somehow kind of comes up into the quad one territory where both are close, that gives you five quad one wins. And you only have to steal one on the road to get to six. Like it feels doable, uh, very doable, especially because Kansas State's so good at home. And and like I said, I kind of gave you worst case scenario there, I think, with three and two at home against those five teams. Yeah. Uh K State currently uh no all they have left are quad one or quad three and four. Uh I guess they do have the the one the game against TCU at home is is a quad two, but Outside of that, uh, they filled up the quad two box, and it's just a lot of big game opportunities for them to go yeah. and, and rack up some significant wins. Yeah, and because this uh, this is technically a quad three game against Oklahoma State, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. then, mm-hmm. which it's at home, so you feel okay about getting yeah. that. You like you should lose to Oklahoma State at home. Uh, yeah. The problem for the teams are going to have is like when they and Kansas State's already avoided one of these is when they go to Stillwater and Morgantown. And where mm-hmm. these games become like a dangerous quad three game. Like Kansas State's yeah. already avoided that at West Virginia, but other teams are going to have to do the same thing. Yeah. Kansas State still has to go to Stillwater. You feel a lot better for K State already having one of those past them and, and and getting the win as opposed to going later in the year where you feel like, hey, we gotta have it here. And you you're banking on it being a win, but you know, you never know what can happen in those situations. So it's good that they got it and we'll see. Uh, let's roll on here before we dive into the big 12 at large and what went down this week and how everything's shaping up. Uh, I got a question for both of you. Cause I think we've, you know, it's been covered from time to time. We know how good a guy like Cam Carter is playing. Um, and he had a strong night, even with having to sit with foul trouble, uh, at various points. And then Arthur Kaluma came through and, and there seems to be a little bit more that he can unlock with his game on a consistent basis. So when all is said and done, who do you think, because I think K-State, the way guys are playing right now, the way things are setting up, I do think that they end up with somebody on the all Big 12 first team at the end of the year. At this point in time, who would you guys say that is, Arthur Kaluma or Cam Carter? I'll say Arthur Kaluma because he shoots more. Because if he shoots more, then, boy, those numbers could really expand already on top of what they already are. I think Cam's going – like, I love Cam Carter, and I think he's still – he's going to be a great player for Kansas State throughout the season. I'm not saying that he's going to become a marginal player. That's not the case. He's going to be one of the most important players for Kansas State no matter what. But they are they are asking so much out of him defensively that I think his offensive numbers are not are going to stagnate or, you know, or remain the same, or even, like, dip even a little bit. Like, because I think Cam Carter's a better shooter than what his numbers are indicating right now. But it's kind of like what some of those Bruce teams were, right? They play, or they have to play so hard on defense to get the job done that it impacts them a little bit offensively. And I think that's what Cam Carter's going to endure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably going to be Arthur Kaluma if it's going to be one of the two, because he's one of the, actually, the only one of, like, I think, three or four players that's top 15 in the big 12 in points and rebounds and the way that he's been rebounding this entire season he's going to be close to being in the top three hunter dickinson's going to be tough to beat at uh, the number one spot but kaluma's i think like four or five rebounds away from being the number two rebounder in the big 12 if he keeps scoring and shoots and shoots a little bit more because it's like we've talked about the last few sundays when he shoots the ball yeah, it looks pretty and it, it's gone in and it feels kind of automatic, kind of like where Keontae Johnson got last year from three, where you feel really good when he when he winds up and gets ready to shoot. Yeah. So it, you want him to take another step scoring. If he takes another step scoring, he's going to be on the first team. Yeah, I, I, I think like right now, people would probably say Cam Carter just because of the numbers. But I think with the way Arthur Kaluma is playing, I think the numbers are only going to get better. I, that at least would be the hope and the expectation where you mentioned the shooting. Like he's shooting almost 40% from three this year on over four attempts a game. Like this is kind of the crazy thing about Kaluma is you look at it, his first two his first two seasons at Creighton, he was at 26.5% and then 31% last year. And that was on like, you know, 3.3, 3.6 attempts per game. He's up that this year and he's exponentially shot up his percentage and he probably needs to shoot more out there for K-State for them to get the offense kind of going how they want. Um, 
and a fan would be here telling us he needs to shoot more threes instead of two point jumpers or uh, whatever the issue is. But and, and apparently all from the left wing. I don't know what's yes, going on. Yes, but just this team makes everything from the left wing. They go to the right wing, and it's like night and day. I don't. I don't understand. I think, that. I think they need to practice by putting like walls up uh, in in the ice center on the left wing so nobody can actually shoot from there in practice. So they are forced to get better at other areas of the floor scoring the if, basketball. If you told me as a team they were shooting 75% from three from the left wing, I would not bat an eye. <laughs> You'd be like, yeah, that seems right. And then they're, you know, 1% from every other spot on the floor. Well, what's crazy to me about uh, Kaluma, and like you just kind of hit on it, like the thing that I was told from Creighton people and like Big East fans is like, Arthur Kluma will drive you crazy sometimes because he's a ball stopper. And I, I texted them after uh, the Baylor game on Tuesday night. And I said, my problem is that Kluma doesn't shoot enough. Yeah. Like he needs to be taking more threes and getting the ball more, I think in late game situations, because I, I think that he's the one that I feel the most comfortable with that could create his own. When, when he's not right, he is a ball stopper though. I will say. Yes. That's true. That is true. Uh, we'll see on on the Cam Carter side of things how it goes. I'm with you, D.Y. I, the shooting, look, he's never been like some overboard great shooter in, in his now three seasons, but he was 33% last year. Um, I kind of nitpicked the 33% last year where I was like, that's not indicative of really how it goes. Like that's using average in the truest sense of the word where it's like for the whole season, Cam Carter did average 33% shooting. But it's like, I'm going to go one of eight this game and then six of seven this game. And then I'm going to have three straight games where I do nothing from you. I'd like just a little more consistency from Cam Carter. And it's the same thing that we're we're asking of Tyler Perry, where you don't have to knock down every single shot you take. But if you can make at least, you know, one in each half for us, that would go a long way for the way this K-State team is playing right now defensively because the games are so tight and lower scoring compared to the rest of the league that, you know, six extra points in a game can be the difference in you, you know, losing by one in Lubbock or coming out on top with a with a big road win in this league. So I think Cam Carter still has the chance and he's going to have the scoring numbers to make the case, but I think to actually get it done and, and to see him there on the, the first team all Big 12, He's going to have to improve the shooting, which, as D.Y. has alluded to, that may just be really tough to do with as much as he's having to do on defense for this team. And my bold prediction would be that Tyler Perry could slide his name into the conversation here because, look, the criticism or the, the questions about his shooting are warranted at this point because his numbers have dipped. But that's also... I don't know if ignoring is the right word, but not at least qualifying it to the point where we have to realize, even as people that are covering Kansas State and fans that are watching and, and casting aspersions as well, realize the adjustment that Tyler Perry's had to make from North Texas to Kansas State. And I don't just mean the, the competition because I don't think it's too much of that. I think it's the radically quicker no not the Kansas State's being as is as, as, um operating at a very very high pace they're not breakneck but it's still considerably faster than what they played in North Texas and he's having to do it all while being on the ball much more than he has his entire career and now lately that's upped even more i mean the guy just played 43 minutes on the ball against one of the best teams in the country. I mean, 43 minutes. Like, you play 35 minutes on the ball, exclusively on the ball, and uh, you're going to get worn out to some level, especially if you guys are playing tough defense and you're playing at still, you know, a greater pace than you have your entire career, which was at North Texas. They were one of the slowest offenses. So I think while it's it's warranted to question the numbers a little bit from a shooting perspective from him, I still think we're almost in an adjustment period or we were just about ready to come out of it. And then he has to, I mean, he's the only point guard available the last two or three games yeah. because David Ames yeah. is not, and Quez Glover is hurt. And, and look, you, you put someone on the ball that much, 
you play him that many minutes, it's it's going to take a toll, and and the toll that it's taken is on his shooting numbers because it hasn't affected his ability to help Kansas State win. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing, and he deserves credit for that because I think he's turned into a better defensive player than most were expecting. He had yep. four steals against Baylor. Four well, steals. If, if you look at, at at those numbers, so you can take the the first – I'm trying to think how many games that would be there for K-State. If you take the first nine games of the season, he only had one game where he had more than two steals, and it was the USC game. He had four of them. And, look, defense is more than just getting steals, but this kind of highlights what he's doing. Since the LSU game, so – that would be K-State's last eight games. He has four games where he's recorded at least three steals for the Cats. Three against LSU, four against Wichita State, three against Chicago State, and four against Baylor. And that that seems to me to be something that's indicative of how the defense is playing, where he's playing smarter on defense, he's putting himself in a better position. Because if you go and look like he's on track to, to be – if not similar, but maybe better than what his steal numbers were last year uh, in terms of volume in certain games at North Texas. And that is that is something he has to adjust to right now, where offensively, I don't know how much of an adjustment he's having to make with his game because of the competition that he's facing. In the Big 12 and playing more power competition, you do have to adjust to, okay, these guys are quicker. These guys are more skilled. Like All of these things make a difference. And it's wild to go and look at what his North Texas career was because I went and looked last year. He didn't play a single non-con game against a power six school. And the year prior, he, he played two of them. He played KU in Miami. So it's not like he had crazy experience playing power six competition before this year. I think in total, if you count NCAA tournament and NIT with the two games his first year at North Texas. And he's played five games against Power Six competition before this season. And, I mean, you think about what K-State then has has already faced this year where obviously they've played four Big 12 games now, but they face Nebraska, LSU, Villanova, Miami, Providence, and USC. Like, he's already eclipsed this season, and we still have 14 games left in the regular season how many power six schools he's, he faced at North Texas. So he's had to adjust, and he's starting to do it really well on that defensive end. And, like, this is where I'll, I'll give credit to to him. And, you know, I would love to see him shoot better. I, I, I love shooters. That is, uh, that is the thing that, you know, I think makes basketball go round. He's not doing it well right now. He needs to get better there. That is, that is still, to me, his best value to this team. But he has found ways to supplement his deficiencies with shooting the basketball – by being a, for the most part, good leader when handling the ball. And defensively, he's really stepped up, and he fits right in with what K-State's doing defensively. And honestly, is probably one of the guys making the biggest you know charge to, to lead by example on that end. So Tyler Perry, uh, sneaking his way in, I it, it may be tough just because he's so far behind you know shooting-wise, and I think that those numbers have to be there. Uh, but he could do it. Especially if they factor in, you know, how good he's been defensively. And I mean, how many, how many all like defensive team guys is K State going to have this year? I mean, well, are they going to end up with like three? Well, they should have Carter and Gasson, probably yeah. two. The, the, Carter, the, the, Gasson. What, what I, for Perry? Look, you'd like him to shoot better. I think he will. And if he do, and and Kansas State would be so much better if he can kind of find his rhythm there. But I could still make an argument, and I know Kalumar and Carter are, are ahead numbers-wise and, and probably for some of these distinctions, but I could still make an argument that the kid, Perry, is the MVP of this team right now just because they would be nowhere without him uh, yeah. because of what's being asked of him and what he is still providing. Like, I get you look at the numbers and you're like, eh, eh, eh. You know, I get it, but like I said, improved defense – and I think it's the best he's rebounded and the best assist numbers of his entire career as well. So he, they are luck. They are fortunate still to what he, and it's, and I get it's hard for some too, because they're, you know, you just saw Marquise Noel last year and this is two different games, but mm -hmm. still what he is doing is a lot for Kansas state. And we've talked about it before. And obviously uh, some of those late games, I mean, Kansas State's won a lot of close games late, right? And especially, you know, you another five and zero in overtime. You have some other ones that were came down to, you know, the the last possession in regulation. But a lot of those times, 
I mean, if we're paying attention, really, it's Tyler Perry making a play here or there, right? Right. I mean, he's one of the most clutch players too. I just don't want us to dwell on just the shooting numbers because he's a lot more than that this year. You, you can see his value when he comes off the floor that they look yeah. so disorganized. And, and like the, this kind of goes back to your point of how much he's playing. He's played more than 40 minutes, almost double the amount than he's played less than 35. Yeah, I think I saw number two. He's almost played 93% of the minutes that Kansas State has in Big 12 games right now. I think yeah. it's 92.7. And when he's off the floor, they they look disjointed on offense. Well, yeah, well, he's the, that's why he's so valuable right now and why I think he's taking too many arrows because he's literally the only point guard. And to do it that well for 43 minutes, I think, deserves credit. Yeah, no, I he – He's doing a lot more, and he's he's in a tough spot with how many minutes he's being asked to play, the role that he's being asked to play, and he, he's he's doing almost as well as he can there. It's just the one thing that is suffering currently is the shooting. So that will uh, that will have to improve and get a little bit better. But you know, we'll we'll see how it, how it goes. And 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 the shooting is probably being impacted by all of that. Oh yeah, yeah, well, for sure. And like it's almost, and then this is just where he's amazing to have too. Is at the end of the game, like outside of the one miss that he had at the end of regulation against Baylor, every time he gets to the free throw line, you think that it's just automatic. Number one free throw shooter in the Big Twelve right now, right? Yeah, I think I I wrote in uh, one of the things before the Texas Tech game, or maybe it was uh, maybe it was the the West Virginia game, but K State I think right now is on pace to have the Big 12 leader in free throw shooting uh, for three straight years, Nigel Pack, Marquise Noel, and now Tyler Perry. And so, I, I believe Kane Carter's in the top five right now. That You know, it, it's good to have Cam Carter uh, be in the mix there and, and be that shows you, a good And that go. shows you that Cam's three-point shooting and Tyler's three-point shooting is a little bit of a mirage right now because of how well they are at the free throw. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's uh, let's roll on here and uh, take a look around the rest of the Big 12 because this is uh, what the carnage looks like after the midweek. TCU gets in the top 25. They're getting respect. We're talking about, at least I am, hey, they should be 3-0 and lean this league with three top 10 wins because they got robbed in Lawrence. And then they lose in overtime at Cincinnati, who we have to start taking a little more seriously now uh, because of – the the results that they've produced to get their two wins k-state they also go to overtime on tuesday night they get a big win against baylor uh their most significant win of the season at this point we mentioned ku taking down oklahoma state and then byu blew out iowa state uh in the second half it was tight at the half the clones were only down four but uh they got behind quickly in the second and byu cruised to a comfortable home win and then last night two games that seemed to go the way people project, projected. OU handles West Virginia easily. Houston blows out Texas Tech. But Texas, oh, the disaster that just keeps on giving. They lose 77-71 to 71 to UCF. What an outcome. Uh, I was looking hard to try and find any way to watch the Longhorn Network to see the collapse in person, so I settled to listening on radio. Boy, I absolutely cannot get enough of Texas losing that game to UCF after leading. I think they got up 15-2 to two at one point to start the game, and they led by 16 at one point. And it got all that much more better after the game when you learned that Rodney Terry did not handle losing that game well at all. Uh, he's <laughs> crying about the horns down being thrown his way by UCF players, and then he's cussing them out in the handshake line afterwards. <laughs> It was the best result of the week, in my opinion, and that includes watching my alma mater beat Baylor, a top-10 team at home. Yeah, I think in the last 17 minutes of the game, UCF outscored Texas by 21 because they went from down 15 to winning by six. So they, I think they outscored them by 21 in the last 15 minutes of the game. Ooh. Uh, no, that's that's about as you know doomsday as you could point out for Texas because, one, you do it at home. Two, it's to UCF and a game that you have to have. And three, then you have your head coach just make a butt of himself, right? <laughs> Afterwards, not once, but twice, right? He doubled down in the press conference, too. So, uh, and to be honest, you know, one of my first reactions to, the, I, I guess we'll go into the uh, 
the handshake line thing for one of my reactions at first is like, if I'm trying Dawkins, that pisses me off. Like I don't need you to school my players. That's how I feel. Yeah. that that That's how I felt. Like I, I texted some people and I said, it's more classless. I think to go after the UCF players and not let Johnny Dawkins just handle it. than them doing the horns down when they weren't doing it to the Texas players. Like, Grow up. You lost. You want to, you want to stop it? Don't lose. Yeah. And, and some of this is a product, too, if I think – well, not a product. I'll just point out what I think is – basically, my thoughts being validated before. I'll, and I'll let Mason talk about the horns down and Ronnie Terry crying. But I, I – for me, like, this season is validating what I thought. Like, I understand why Texas may have thought that they were backed into a corner and probably had to hire Rodney Terry – Based off last year's results, you kind of look uh, like stupid maybe if you don't. So you got to give them a year maybe or another year. I get it. But nothing short of last year's spectacular finish somehow, short of anything else, like everything in Ronnie Terry's career up to that point suggested that he should not be the Texas head coach. And now this is bearing itself out. You know, I'll also throw in that uh, last year when they beat K State at home, uh, the Tex- there were Texas players making fun of the Wabash, and that wasn't considered classless by Rodney Terry. But the thorns down—that's where he draws the line. Oh, trust me, I uh, I'm very <laughs> close to going through and watching highlights from every Texas win last year and seeing how their players uh, conducted themselves, uh, because I I can only imagine that those guys beat KU in Austin the last game of the regular season last year and handled it with immense amounts of class. I, I can't imagine that there was anything that went on there uh, that that wasn't disparaging. Look, I this is just – I'll start with what D.Y. was saying because I, I agree with it totally, and I thought this last year, like, go ahead and hire Rodney Terry. Make him your guy because, look, I just sat around my very first year in Wichita on the radio – Greg Marshall gets fired three weeks before the season. Honestly, very similar deal to what happened with Chris Beard, where there are allegations of physical abuse, and you're like, okay, this guy, even if you know he's not going to be criminally charged, like we can't have this dude leading our program. Like there's too much smoke. He's not the you know he's not probably the best guy. Like let's separate here. You bring in an interim coach, and guess what happened? With Wichita State. They just kept winning games in the COVID Isaac year, Brown. and they had to hire Isaac Brown, who was wildly underqualified for that job, and they were terrible the next two years. And that's the same thing for Rodney Terry, where he made one NCAA tournament at Fresno State. He was terrible at UTEP. Oh, by the way, his best season at UTEP was the COVID year when he went 12-12. and 12. So, oh. like, this guy has no business being the head coach at Texas – and it's playing out right now that they're one and three in the Big 12. As for the horns down thing, dude, like, suck it the heck up, man. Like, do you understand? This is a message to everybody affiliated with Texas. The more you cry about this stuff, the more people are going to do it. Horns down would have died if you had just, like, not acknowledged it or made it as big of a deal as it is, but you freak out about it. And, you know, then we have the whole every year the, the the officiating guy at Big 12 Media Days gets asked, is horns down a penalty? It's like it's pretty darn simple to explain how this works. If you go up to a Texas player after scoring a touchdown and you just horns down right into his eyeballs, they're going to flag you for that. But they would do that if you went up to him and gave him like a thumbs up afterwards. It's not the hand signal. It's that you're up in this guy's face. If you score a touchdown – and you go and flash a horns down at a random student or a cheerleader, nobody gives a crap. Like, they're not a part of the game. Taunt them all you want. Like, I'm team UCF here. I hope Johnny Dawkins didn't even address this with his team. I, If Johnny Dawkins does apologize or address it, he is soft, in my opinion, which that might be the case anyways. But, like, Rodney Terry, just, just shut up and focus on your own team's problems, dude, because you've got way more talent there than – what has been reflective in your play. Uh, So I I don't know what to expect from all this, but that was a terrible look by him last night, the way he handled it. I haven't seen kids say cry once when people do the the, uh, imitate or mimic the Wabash thing once they beat Kent State. I haven't seen kids stay cry. I didn't see Kate stay cry when Fred Hoiberg in Nebraska went into the locker room after spanking the Wildcats in Manhattan and played 
blow down by little baby, right? I mean, that was yeah. very much in Kansas State's face. I don't, I haven't seen West Virginia cry when every time they lose a game of football or basketball, everybody plays country roads in a locker room. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I have not heard West Virginia complain one time <laughs> after a game and been like, you know, I thought it was pretty classless that they played a little John Denver after beating our butts here. It's and like, every team does it. Like we've heard Kansas yes. State play. Yeah, country roads yeah. in the locker room in, in Morgantown. Yes, and the the lady there was like, "Yeah, like this happens after every game they lose." Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it it happens there, and I am yet to hear them freak out about it. So uh, this is it's a weird Texas thing, and this is just another example of why Texas is so unlikable and why people are just you know sick of their act because they're way less important than they think they are. And then they act like this is some heinous crime that's been, uh, you know, acted against them. So I don't know. We'll see. If they're Uh, offended by that, though, the SEC is going to just tear them apart. Yeah. I mean, the SEC, they're going to throw horns down at you and say a bunch of terrible things while they're (laughs) doing it. At least it's nonverbal communication right here. Uh, So breaking news. Uh, We have we found a picture of Rodney Terry. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Do we uh, do we think uh, do we think he's got any comment on this? Oh, no, uh, <laughs> I I can't I can't stand him. I, I think I think he is fake, and I think we saw that last night where uh, he he came out and and was all against that. Uh, other thoughts on the Big Twelve and the week that was outside of Texas falling on their face at home against UCF after having a sixteen point lead, which I mentioned earlier to you guys. UCF in both Big 12 wins this year against KU and Texas, they've trailed by 16 points in those games and somehow have come back to win. Um, I would I would probably float out there. I mean, outside of K-State and Baylor, this was kind of just a bad week for games uh, because like Houston and Tech, Tech was kind of due for a loss maybe, and yep. Houston was looking for revenge. And then KU played a terrible opponent. OU played a terrible opponent. Um, and the other games, they just kind of happened. I'm not sure many people thought yeah, like their games oh. just happened. Yeah, I, I got four four things probably that I always said, and I'll go one by one, and we can discuss each one. The first one, and I and I know you'll you'll probably disagree, especially Macy, because I think he had KU first in his inaugural yep. or last week's Big 12 Power Rankings. But I think, despite in general, I think we could probably all agree here. We'll see. In spite of losing those two road games, which I think is still like Mason said. Houston acclimating a bit to the Big 12 and those environments because they're going to be tough. I still think neutral site, like, maybe, and maybe not neutral site, just in general, I still think Houston, one, is really, really good. And two, I, I think I like them more than everyone else in the Big 12 still. I do. Yeah, I, I think that I trust Houston probably the most. Like the-, uh, the only two that, you know, like are touching – Closely touching Houston right now is Baylor and KU, but look, I think K, this KU team is a lot more flawed than they typically are, especially mm-hmm. on the defensive end because yeah. Hunter Dickinson's great on offense, but boy, it's hard to navigate them around them on the defensive end. Um, the only thing that's kind of, uh, to be honest, the only thing that's kind of KU saving grace right now is Kevin McCullers having a career season. That's literally their saving grace because yeah. Marco Jackson is really bad and Hunter Dickinson is a liability on the defensive end. So that's why I got to go Houston over KU still. And Baylor, I really, really like Baylor. They probably have the most upside of those three teams, to be quite honest. They are just not playing good defense, and their three-point shooting has regressed so much that they're struggling in every game right now. The The McCuller thing is is wild. I mean, he is the he's taken a massive jump in his shooting, and his scoring has almost doubled from his best season ever. Uh, so they are fortunate to be getting that version. I, I'll say this: if if everybody went out onto the floor with blank uniforms and they played in the same building, Houston would be my pick for the best team in in the league. But I've been on this earth twenty five years. I've seen a lot of Big Twelve basketball. I know the history of how this plays out, and I know at the end of the day, Kansas is going to win the Big Twelve. So uh, they're going to have to lose like five more games until they get knocked off. Uh, my pedestal is number one in the Big 12 rankings. Because, look, I agree. They are a totally flawed team. This is on paper and in the way that they've played. They look like one of the worst uh, Kansas teams that I've seen. But I just know how this thing works out. And 
uh, until they, you know, they kind of get proven to go the opposite way. We'll see how it goes. And, and Houston's two losses last week kind of shook me a little bit. So we'll see if they can get real hot and, you know, it's going to take more than just beating the crap out of Texas tech uh, to get me to come around on you being the best team in the league. I will say though, the, the road games for KU that are left, I mean, it, it's at West Virginia, it's at Iowa State, at K-State, at Texas Tech, at OU, at Baylor, at Houston. Like oh, I, look, I, I went to bat for, for KU uh, it, when the schedule came out. Th- they were given a pretty tough hand uh, scheduling-wise this year because they have to play two games against Baylor, two games against K-State, and two games against Houston. I'm not sure that there's another team that's like that. And you throw into the fact now that we know what we know about OU. They have to play Oklahoma twice this year. And so you already played a top 10 OU team. They're 15 right now. Like they they got handed a a pretty tough schedule. I don't feel bad for them, but frauds, Oklahoma's fraud. I look, you're not, you're not, you're preaching the choir here. I think OU, BYU, Iowa State, I think a lot of the, the things that favor them is a little fraudulent. They're maybe better than I initially anticipated, but they're not yeah. anywhere near the level of unbeatable or, you know, I some like, overly impressive team. I like Iowa State the most out of those three you mentioned, I think, still. Yeah, I agree. I think I took the clones over BYU in the centers right now. I would. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of those teams are jumping up there. That's one of my takeaways. My next one, and we'll try to rip through these. And maybe this one's just a me thing because I was the one totally wrong on this team. I had them 10th in my power rankings last week. It was totally different than you guys. And I was proved to be completely wrong because of the way they're playing. Um, obviously, they got screwed in Lawrence. The Cincinnati loss aside, I look, I'm a lot higher on TCU right now than I was even 10 days ago. They are, they are a tough outfit. And I think the next few weeks could prove that out because, look, TCU can win their next two games still too as well because they're home against Iowa State, um, tough game, but they're the home team, and then they go to Stillwater. So I and then a week after that they get Texas Tech at home and Texas at home. So yeah. the Frogs got a nice little stretch coming up here to where they could really do some damage and put themselves into the discussion to be in the Big Twelve champion. In my opinion, I think assuming this assuming disaster does not happen, I think TCU is good enough to compete for the Big Twelve title. Emmanuel Miller becoming a legitimately like really good Big 12 player. It's kind of wild. <laughs> well, it, TCU, I I am in the same boat as DY. I think that from what I've seen, like the opportunity is there for them. Uh, the Cincinnati loss kind of gives me some pause just because like I get it. It's a road game. The Big 12 is unpredictable and all this. And Cincinnati is better than I've given them credit for. I mean, I – I saw a lot of Cincinnati in, in the American and, you know, I, I like Wes Miller, but like the teams really hadn't come through that much. they have been pretty disappointing, but he was able to bring in some different talent this year and he's, he's made them a truly competitive big 12 team. So maybe I shouldn't totally write TCU off, but I, I think they're going to have to to go out and prove themselves a little bit more. Um, I mean, like DY said, they've got a nice little cushion here where, you get a home game against Iowa State this weekend and then an, a road game at Oklahoma State. It, it's just going to be telling how they handle uh, when they go to Waco and and then they come back against Texas Tech. Like those are going to be kind of fascinating. Uh, and and we know that like the Tech and the TCU people, they don't seem to, to get along for whatever reason. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see how it, it I, ends I, up working out. Yeah. Part of that's for Texas Tech really tries to claim Dallas, even though they're really far away. I think it's because they're, large- they're hours away. I know. I think it's because they have a large alumni still packed into there, but I think TCU gets offended. It's weird. Yeah. Obviously, you got Baylor there. It's another one. But um, my my next one, as we're ripping through these, was kind of what you alluded to. Cincinnati's a lot better than I thought, too. Mm. Um, look, it look, we thought it was a good win or good luck. Lo- not a good loss. There's never <laughs> such thing as a good loss. But you lose to Texas at home on a Max Aceman's miracle shot. You're like, okay, so today's probably pretty good. Mm-hmm. Looking back on it, it's like, man, you should have beat Texas at home probably. Um, a really good – you you beat BYU on the road by double digits. You beat TCU, we already said. They almost beat the Baylor in Waco. I think Cincinnati's pretty solid. And the next four games are really going to tell us a lot. The home against Oklahoma coming up on Saturday is a big game for the Bearcats. And they could really – prove something there if they can win that because that's a winnable game because it is at home. Yeah. Obviously, you don't expect them to win at KU, but the next two they can get 
after that even because you, yeah. you host UCF and you go to West Virginia. So they could win three of their next four, and all of a sudden you're talking about a team that's above 500 in the Big 12 in their first year, and I don't think anyone would have thought that. So I think so today is better than I thought, and now they're heading into a stretch where I think they can make some movement if they, they play to their ceiling. Now they could ultimately collapse and be who they thought who we thought they were too, but I wouldn't ignore what Cincinnati is doing right now. No, I mean, they almost beat Baylor. They should have beat Texas. Yeah. Like, they're a pretty solid squad. Like, I really like Wes Miller, so, like, I, I'm happy that they they found some success. And they're just an interesting team because, like, before conference play started, I'm not sure I could have told you one player on their entire roster. Jizzle James. <laughs> okay. Was he good? I don't even know. No. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, yeah. he – he, he played, uh, but he's not very good. He was uh he was a highly sought after re recruit, Edrin James's son. That's Ooh. not even a joke. He really is Edrin's boy. <laughs> Edrin's boy, yeah. He nope. was he was the number seventy three recruit in the class of twenty twenty three. So he's he's the real deal uh, in terms of you know recruiting prowess and everything. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I look, I I look at them. I'm, I'm with you. I could not have told you. Uh, anybody on their roster? I guess a CJ Frederick, you know, who transferred from Kentucky, uh, and, in Iowa, you know, and uh, in Iowa, uh, and barely, you know, did anything for Kentucky last year. But outside of that, I I really couldn't have done much for you. Uh, John Newman's like the one holdover that I I got to actually see play, uh, like when I would cover Wichita State a little bit. So I guess he's there. But when, once they took away, like. Some of the other guys, there were like dudes with like crazy blonde hair and stuff. I'd be like, ah, okay, I, these guys, I, I don't know anybody now. But I, I, Cincinnati deserves respect. Their two Big 12 losses are by four points. Uh, the one against Texas, as we talked about, Max Asmus probably traveled on it. And also it took like two bounces and then fell through. So it, there really is a chance that like Cincinnati's the real deal. And that's going to be, that's going to be a fascinating game because K State goes there, I think. The, after that, they'll have just two games left. So very end of the season, first weekend in March, K-State is in Cincinnati. Um, that That's going to be significant because both those teams might be fighting for, for NCAA tournament spots. And lastly, oh, I got one more thing. But uh, most disappointing team, I think we've already covered. That's Texas, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're not really close either. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't think there's any, even another contender, <laughs> is there? No. No, not at all. I mean, here here's a look at the Big 12 standings right now. Uh, but it's it's very clearly Texas because West Virginia and Oklahoma State is predictable. Um, I, maybe I'm a little shocked that Oklahoma State is this bad just because, like, Mike Boynton's at least been able to get through the non-con without me thinking he's a total fraud. That's not been the case this time around. Um, and West Virginia, we knew what the situation was going to be. Outside of that, everybody else has been, you know, fairly impressive to me and probably played above expectations to this stage. Yep. Texas is the only possible answer here because they should not be one and three in big 12 play given the schedule that they've played so far. If they had gone out and they, you know, if they had had to play TCU schedule to start or something else, I would have been like, okay, I get it a little bit. Like you're telling yourself as a fan, yeah, we're one and three, but like, look at it. The schedule is going to get easier. If you're Texas, like, I can't tell you that things are going to get easier for you it's right worse. now because you're, yeah. it's Baylor this weekend. It's at OU. It's at BYU. Houston at home at TCU. Then Iowa State at home. Their next six games are against top twenty-five opponents. Three of them being on the road. Like it's not easier for you right now. And after that stretch, you get a little bit of a breather. You play West Virginia at home, and then they finish out the year at Houston, K State on Big Monday, at KU, at Tech another breather, Oklahoma State at home, and then at Baylor and a home game against Oklahoma. The fact that you've already botched games with West Virginia and UCF, Texas, you're already out of the Big 12 title race. Now, I don't think they were going to win it anyways, but you were out of it at this point in time. Now you're really looking around and saying, we're going to go from maybe being comfortably in the NCAA tournament to this team could theoretically end up on the bubble, and it wouldn't surprise me. And somebody's going to have to get left out of the NCAA tournament in the Big 12 outside of just the two crap schools and probably UCF. Texas right now is candidate number one for that to happen. 
Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're out right now, I think. They should be out right now. They've only beat one team on the top of 75 of the net. Man, not and good. Then, the last thing for me was, like, we talked about it, but, like, four through seven, it was very tough to differentiate when I'm doing these power rankings. And for me, that was TCU, Iowa State, Texas Tech, and K-State. Those four are very similar right now. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah. ultimately, there might be a little separation between TCU and the other three. I That's fair. But it, it's yeah. still tight. I mean, because I think there's tiers, right? You got Houston, Baylor, Kansas. Uh, however way you want to order those three. And then, yeah, I think you have TCU, Iowa State, Tech, K-State. Now, some might want to group Cincinnati, Oklahoma, and BYU in there, too. I don't. The, the middle of the league is just so similar, and it's going to come down to did you have a good night shooting? Yeah. Are you the home team? Like, those are the two things with the middle of the league. But the you're going to see, thing. like, that's who's going to win. Yeah. I don't, is TCU going to have a home court this year? They haven't yet. So, <laughs> mm, I yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, it, it, I mean, I think they can get a little rowdy, but how rowdy can, you know. Yeah, that's what makes it trickier for the Frogs, right? Like, regardless of how special or good they might end up being, they're yeah. not going to have the, the home – tough environment that like Iowa state tech and K state will. Yeah, that, that is going to, to kind of hold them back a little bit. All right. Uh, real quick, as we close out, let's, let's focus on the team, the four teams that are currently tied at the top, Baylor tech, K state and KU. Uh, two of those we think are there to stay and we'll duke it out all year long. K state and Texas tech though, probably not going to be there when we talk about this same topic in two weeks, but can anybody make the case or try to say that K-State, what they're doing, and again, we know that they haven't played the toughest schedule yet compared to others. They're kind of in a Texas boat where you look around and say, eh, I don't know, your schedule's still going to have some some tough spots. I mean, is is there any realm where you think K-State can make, you know, three and one turn into seven and two or something like that when we're talking about this halfway through the, the Big 12 schedule? What I will say is you can say that about K-State's schedule and you would be accurate, but, I mean, KU's played UCF and Oklahoma State of the four. Yeah. Now, it gets really tough for them after as soon as well, but they're, but they're also their next two is at West Virginia and a home against Cincinnati. So you could be – or you could argue that KU is kind of like K-State where they kind of get a smooth runway at the beginning and then it will pick up. The problem is you already lost one of them to UCF, so – I don't know. That's where you are there. Uh, like, ultimately, I think I would agree. KU and Baylor are in the league of their own in comparison to K-State and Tech. I would say Tech and K-State are just kind of scrappy, right? Texas Tech plays great defense. Kansas State plays great defense. They're both tough. Um, that's why I think both teams will grid out an NCAA tournament bid, uh, especially with their home environments, because they're going to be able to notch quad one wins because it's so tough to win at their place. So I like both. I don't know if I like both thing around for the Big 12 title hunt, though. I think we saw last night. When you play teams will matter, but I think you saw last night like Tech is not in that category uh, when you get blown out by that much on the road. And I, I would say Kansas State, they're probably going to have a night like that at some point, too. Um, uh, maybe when they go to Houston or, or when they go to KU. So it, it, K-State and Tech are so similar. Uh and it makes sense because they're both from the Scott Drew tree, Graham McCaslin and Jerome Tang. I like Kansas State. Now, you said two weeks we, they might not be there. I say they might still because if you beat Oklahoma State, and like you said, if you find a way to pull out one of those two road games, then I think you're right yeah. there still. Yeah, I mean, you win three the next four somehow, and you're at seven and two, and then you're still you're still there. So, I mean, it, and it's possible. I mean, K-State almost won in Ames last year. Yeah. yeah. Here, here's the thing. Like, if they win one of those two road games, tough to do, probably won't happen. I don't. I think I will pick A-State to lose both. You Spoiler alert. But let's say you beat Oklahoma State at home and you win one of those. So then you go two and one. What are you? Five and two in the league at that point. You should beat Oklahoma. You're six and two. Then you go to Oklahoma State. Are you seven and two? If, yeah, can you, if you, and then, so are you seven and two in the Big 12 when you host KU? I mean, oh. 
it, it's possible. Uh, I, I, I think that they are capable. I think they can go out and win one of those games at Iowa State or Houston just because of, look, I'm, I'm not totally sold on Iowa State. I'm not saying they do it, but I think that they can. And, and I mean, depending on how they play against Oklahoma State, there could be some momentum there. And I, I think it'll be a good game between them and Iowa State. Uh, on Wednesday night, and it, that's probably a really good. That's a really good barometer for what K State is the rest of the way. Is what kind of battle they put up in Ames because the crowd's going to be good. You're going to be facing a really solid team. How do you handle that, and what does it look like? I, that's that's going to be fascinating. That'll tell us a lot about K State moving forward in terms of they've already taken one step up the rung in the Big Twelve, and you know overall and how we perceive them. But they could probably take another step if they go and have a really good showing in Ames. So uh, and we talked I'll, about avoid, avoid, avoiding that bad loss that teens will have to do this year when they go to Stillwater, Morgantown. Mm-hmm. Kansas State already did that when they went to Morgantown. Luckily, fortunately, got them early. I think that was a good thing. They have to do the same thing when they go to Stillwater. We talked about that. It's kind of a trap game too because they got to go to Stillwater two days before they host KU. Yeah, and we know last year, two days before they hosted KU, they uh, went and laid a dud in Fort Worth against TCU. So we'll see how it plays out. But that is uh, a look at the Big 12. We'll have our full Big 12 power rankings up on K-State Online on Friday, so be sure to check those out. Good way to get prepped and previewed for the weekend of Big 12 action where K-State will host Oklahoma State, and uh, they'll try and keep themselves at least for another game in that tie at the top of the Big 12 standings. And then uh, we'll just see what next week brings with two really tricky road trips for the Wildcats against top 25 teams. For Drew Galloway, Derek Young, I am Mason Voth. Thank you for watching and listening to the KSO Show. You can get more K-State Online coverage over at On3 or right here on the K-State Online YouTube page.